Welcome to a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church in Boonville with the sermon of Mother Linda Logan for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. from Luke's Gospel, of which we read the first part last Sunday and the second part just now, is one that always stuns me. Jesus has gone back home to Nazareth after starting his ministry elsewhere and has stood up in the synagogue to read. Taking the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, he unrolls it to the words which proclaim, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then, rolling up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant and sits down. The eyes of all in the synagogue are upon him. And he says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The reaction is understandably one of amazement. After all, this is a young man these people have known as the carpenter's kid from down the street. But that's all the response from the hometown congregation Luke lets us hear before Jesus cuts in and challenges their amazement, telling them that no prophet has ever been accepted in the prophet's hometown. And because of that, he says, God sends the prophets to the Gentiles. This declaration angers the people so much that they rise up in a mob and drive Jesus out of town with the intention 
of hurling him over the cliff to his death. But he passes through the midst of them and goes down to Capernaum, where the people are likewise astounded at his teaching, but in this case because of his authority. It's the swiftness of the movement from astonishment to murderous intent on the part of the congregation that has always perplexed me. That and what strikes me as Jesus' deliberate egging of them on. What's going on here? Well, part of what's going on is going on at the level of the text. Both Matthew and Mark tell of Jesus' rejection in his hometown synagogue, but neither of those Gospels tells of rejection that mounts to murderous rage. Nor does either of those Gospels have Jesus quote Isaiah or cite examples in the scriptures of foreigners experiencing God's help when Israel did not. Luke shows Jesus citing Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 and Isaiah 58 verse 6 because those verses sum up who Jesus is as Luke demonstrates in his telling of the gospel. And, it is thought, Luke shows Jesus giving scriptural examples of God helping persons or nations other than Israel because Luke's gospel is aimed at a non-Jewish Gentile audience. These are the technical things that are going on in the text. And knowledge of these matters helps me redirect my focus from the matter of motivation behind Jesus' incendiary words and the congregation's rage to the heart of the matter or theme of the passage. Simply put, that is that the hometown folk could not see the presence of the sacred in their midst, nor could they see the reality of God's liberation and favor, which they have just heard in the reading from Isaiah. Well, you're probably breathing a sigh of relief as you hear this, and you're probably thanking God that you are not part of that group in the synagogue, right? Because you and I know who Jesus is, right? Well, maybe we do, and maybe we don't. Let's look at this a little more deeply. As Luke gives us the scene, Jesus declares that he himself is the fulfillment of the Old Testament concept of the Jubilee year. Now, this idea, which is set forth in the book of Leviticus, is that of the year of the Lord's favor, the time when inequalities in society are to be corrected. As Leviticus sets it out in chapter 25, it is the time when slaves are to be set free. Land is to be returned to its original owners and debts are to be canceled. Now, it's unclear whether or not this ideal was ever enacted in Israel or Judah. But it is very clear that this ideal was what Jesus both proclaimed and lived out in his teaching and healing. 
in all his movement among people. The words that Luke tells us he used to announce his ministry are a restatement of the Jubilee theme as it is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And Isaiah 58, verse 6 reads, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? All of the gospel that follows this pronouncement shows us an anointed one who spends his life doing just these things. And the other gospels, although they don't show Jesus quoting Isaiah, do show him enacting the Jubilee concept. And Mark's gospel just goes right ahead and declares that in the teaching and actions of Jesus, the reign of God is being enacted. This being the case, it follows that those people who follow Jesus are the people who act in ways that accord with Jesus' ministry. This means that if we are to be counted among those who recognize the presence of the sacred in Jesus, then we must be people who actively work to correct injustice and liberate people from every kind of oppression. Do you hear the connection with the baptismal covenant? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? We are baptized into a ministry of fighting injustice and oppression. And not just that which is directed against us, but that which is directed against others. So let's go back to the very first line of today's reading from the Gospel and think, what would it have been like to hear Jesus say, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What would it have been like to hear him say that he is the one anointed by God to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and to proclaim that this is the year of the Lord's favor? What would it have been like to hear this when you were drowning in debt, when you had lost the vision of life you once had, when you had given up hope of ever breaking free from the systems of society that oppressed you? Or, conversely, what would it have been like to hear this when good news to the poor might mean less profit for you? When sight to the blind might mean you'd see things you had been avoiding? When freedom to the oppressed 
meant that the systems that worked to your advantage would have to be changed in order to work for those whom the systems hold down. Think about it. Because he is saying it now. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What is it like to hear Jesus say this?